just asked Peter to pass the band of I didn't know I'd be speaking from a tanning booth. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Jimmy. I am an alcoholic. Grateful to be alive and sober. And uh, it's customary where I come from to let you know that I have a home group. It's called the Design for Living Group in Neptune, New Jersey, on the Jersey Shore. I have a sponsor, a service sponsor. I sponsor a lot of guys. But most importantly, I've been sober since my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was on March 28, 1987. So um, <clears throat> extremely grateful for this way of life and for Alcoholics Anonymous. And just to give you a little visual, I'm going to steal a line from my good friend Paul, who will be speaking here uh, uh, t- Tuesday. You don't want to miss that, 2 o'clock Tuesday. <laughs> so come off the beach and come see Paul. <laughs> But you know how we are in AA, you know, you, you, you hear it three times or you say it three times, it's your line, right? So uh, so I live 60 miles south of New York City on the ocean. If you go out to the ocean, make a left, go 1,300 miles, you'll find us. And, uh, you know, uh, my my where I live and where Paul lives, you know, it's kind of known as the Irish Riviera uh, by the locals and by, uh, you know, the Chamber of Commerce. And, uh, you know, al- members of Alcoholics Anonymous like to call it cirrhosis by the sea, you know, and uh, so... I stole that off him a long time ago, but that'll be the last line. <laughs> and I want to thank Karen and Robin and Judy. Uh, I think the pool boy called me. Uh, the Latin uh, aerobics lady, she called me. I mean, the hospitality's been incredible here. And uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me and my wife, Mary Beth, and our friend Jen and Pia. I got so many friends here. And uh, I always thought that they sent the witness protection program out west. I'm really surprised to see so many friends here down south, you know. So, uh, you know, I got one question. Doesn't anybody work anymore? I mean, it's, it's crazy. But, uh, Kathy, what a host. Oh my God, what a host. And, uh, she, thank you. You know, she said to me when we got in the car, she said, uh, I want to give you the Florida experience. A real, you know, the weather down here is beautiful. Fort Lauderdale, oh, man, you're going to love it. So, like she just said, we went to a CVS, and she locked the keys in the car. (laughs) So we sat, sat, we stood in a 110-degree parking lot at CVS, and thank you for that experience. What were we doing? (laughs) But but, but Kathy, she's a real biker, you know, a self-proclaimed biker, you know, real outlaw, badass, right? <laughs> so we get off the plane. She says to, to me and Mary Beth, she goes, so you're from New Jersey? We said, yeah. She goes, uh, do you know any gangsters like Tony Sobrano? <laughs> well, Kathy, that's a TV character. We're from, the Jer- we're from the Jersey Shore. We know real people like Snooky, like Jay Well. <laughs> and if you're over 40 years old, just lean into someone who's young and they'll explain that. Let me start my clock here. I'll be here up in three hours. <laughs> so I always like to start that on February 26, 1958, I was born perfect and I was quickly handed over to these two character defects called mom and dad. <laughs> and yeah, I get a little joke out of that, a little laugh out of that, but the truth of the matter is, that's the guy I am. I'm the guy that just blames everyone for the way I, I feel inside, the things that are going on in my life. Everything that's wrong in my life has always been someone else's fault. And obviously my parents were the first people out of the shoot that I blamed for the way my life was. You know, and I don't know what was wrong with me. I just felt like that my parents, you know, they, they did everything for us. You know, uh, that we have five, uh, five kids in my family. My, mo- my mom was a stay at home mom. My dad was a, you know, he was a butcher. He was a hard worker. You know, they took care of us. You know, I introduced them to a way of life of, uh, eventually that they didn't even know existed. You know, like many of us. You know, and, uh, you know, it's really funny. I think about, you know, 1958, you know, 20 years earlier, approximately a little bit longer, you know, exactly seven miles west of my front door where those parents brought home their fourth child who had so many hopes for this kid and so many dreams for this kid and so many plans for this kid, you know. Uh, it was seven miles west 20 years earlier at a place in Newark, New Jersey, uh, at an office building at 17 Williams Street on the sixth floor where they were writing a book, a book called Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was going to take that book to give this, these parents, this kid, this way of life that they always wanted for me. 
So it's really amazing when I think about history and how it's all been laid out for us already. All we need to do is come in all the way and sit down all the way and just get a sponsor, join a home group, do the things we do in here to stay sober. So, you know, I grew up in northern New Jersey. I grew up right across from Manhattan on the Jersey side of the Hudson River. Uh, it's, it's a very, at that time, it's a very blue-collar neighborhood. Everyone's a cop. Everyone's a fireman. Everyone's a truck driver. My dad was a butcher. Uh, you know, uh, not much education, you know. Uh, you know, if you saw me standing on the corner with Peter, you know, you drive by and you'd yell out to us, hey, there's a dead bird. We, me and him would both look up. We didn't know any better. We're not too bright, you know. <laughs> the, only re- the only requirement for membership in the neighborhood was five or more kids. <laughs> all, like I said, all the moms stayed home, all the dads worked. And it was a great time to grow up. With all these kids and all these events, there was always birthday parties, christenings, you know, you name it, it was going on. And the thing that was at every event was king alcohol. And from a six-year-old, a seven-year-old looking out, you know, this disease of perception, we hear that line all the time. But the truth is, my perception of what alcohol looked like looking at all these parties, seeing my old man, seeing my older brothers, seeing the neighbors all take a drink and have fun, you know. So I equate alcohol to fun. I equate alcohol to some sort of freedom. You know, problem solved. It just seems like it's a, when you take a drink of alcohol, everything's okay, right? And in my house, every day at 5 o'clock, my dad would come home. My dad is cunning, baffling, and powerful. My dad's a guy that I'm terrified of growing up. My dad's a Korean War vet. He's a tough guy. You know, he comes from that generation. You know, there's no fireside chat. There's no hugs. There's no I love yous. He gets angry at everything or he drinks at everything. You know, he's a provider, but I'm afraid of my father. But every night at 5 o'clock, what would happen is my dad would come in the door and my mother would make these two pictures, one called Martinis, the other one called Manhattans. And what I would witness is what we all have witnessed and all our experience is taking that first drink. And my dad would take that first drink and all of a sudden he became a different person. All of a sudden he wanted to be the guy that wanted to have a catch in the backyard or a guy that was telling some jokes or just having some fun. But don't let me fool you, there were those days. Paulette talked about it last night. I told her I think I grew up in the same family. We were separated at birth because what happened was some of those days my dad would take that first drink and all of a sudden the explosion would happen in my house and the rage would go on. And all of a sudden the plates would be going across the kitchen or a kitchen chair would be flying across the kitchen or, you know, one of us young kids would be flying across the kitchen and my dad grabbed us. And I was terrified of my father growing up. Terrified. So I have a lot of fear growing up. I have a lot of insecurity growing up. Now, that doesn't make me alcoholic, but it just makes me a kid that's really screwed up. You know, and the other thing that's going on in my house is secrets. Because, you see, I grew up in a house maybe like your house, where you don't talk about what's going in your house, going on in your house. What goes on in your house stays in your house. You don't go out to your neighbors or you don't go out to your friends and say, this is what's going on. I'm afraid or I'm insecure or whatever the character defect is because I don't even know how to express that stuff at six, seven, eight, nine years old. I live in a neighborhood where there's a bar on every corner. I'd walk up to the schoolyard to play ball with my friends and I'd look in that bar and whatever I see, I'd see you guys in there. I see you guys playing pool, watching a ball game, having shuffleboard. I see you women in there trying to pick up these guys, you know, and again, this disease of perception, I can't wait to be doing this stuff. So even though I see the dark side, I also see the light side because I could easily push the dark side to the side. And I can't wait to do this. And at the age of 13 years old, I pick up my first drink. And I can remember like it happened yesterday, 51 years ago. I remember being in a cemetery with five guys, and here comes that first bottle. It's cold 45 malt liquor. And I put my hand in it, and I start drinking on that cold 45 malt liquor. Here comes that second bottle. It's called Mohawk Blackberry Brandy, and I start drinking on that Blackberry Brandy. And what I could tell you here, standing here today, is looking back 51 years ago, I'm alcoholic right out of the gate. And why I could tell you that with such assurance is because I know what I suffer from today. I understand the physical allergy. I understand the obsession. I understand all that stuff today. I couldn't tell you that then, but I could tell you that today. And I look back 51 years ago, and that first night that I took a drink, not only did I black out, not only did I puke purple, not only did I took a beating from my father, my mother grounded me for life, but the hook was in. I couldn't wait to do it again. And as I've learned from so many good men in this group, I had no power, no choice, or no control in my body once I take that first drink. 
I couldn't stop drinking at the age of 13 years old. And I didn't go out and be an everyday drinker from that point. But what started to happen is that second leg of the three-legged stool started to set in, and that's an obsession. The idea that's so strong it overcomes all other ideas. I can't wait till after the football game. I can't wait till the dance. I can't wait the next weekend to recreate what I just did with those friends because something happened to me, like everyone in this room, on that first night of drinking. That magic elixir that went down the pipe all of a sudden took away everything I was feeling. And what's the matter with me at 13 years old? You know, I was talking to Paul yesterday, and I went to Paul's wedding five years ago, him and Catherine over here, and uh, I'll never forget this because Paul's daughter was 13 years old, and I have a fourth cousin that's, I don't even know how to explain that, but I call him my, I call him my nephew, you know, it's easier, you know? And Paul's daughter invited my nephew to this wedding, and there's like 15, 13-year-old girls and him, you know, and he's there with his little Game Boy playing, you know? And I couldn't, I, I turned to my wife at one point during the, during the wedding, and I just looked at him, and I said, what was wrong with me at 13 years old? I'm looking at this kid, he's a baby-faced kid, what was wrong with me? Apparently everything. Apparently all this fear, all this insecurity, the rage I had inside of me, the conflict that I had inside of me. You know, I don't know how to put words to that stuff at that age. I don't even know what I'm feeling. I just feel mixed up, screwed up, but I know one thing. I take a drink of King Alcohol, and all of a sudden I feel okay. And what happened is I just stepped on a path that really took me to nowhere. And over the next 16-year period, I got to that place of incomprehensible demoralization, dying of this thing that I didn't even know that I was dying from. You know, I talk about two things in high school. I don't, you know, I'm not going to take you through uh, my whole life, but it, two things that were really, really showed up. At, and, and I just started thinking about this and just started talking about this. You know, I was a basketball player. You know, just because I'm tall doesn't mean I play basketball, but I was a basketball player, right? <laughs> And we had this big game one day, and I'll never forget this. It was a big, it was a big competition. It was North Jersey versus a Catholic school in South Jersey. And I got hammered the night before. And uh, I had to get on a bus early that next morning, and I am shaken. I am, I got, I don't, it might have been DTs, who knows. I'm sick, and I sit next to a kid who just happens to be just like me. And he says, Jimmy, you know how you cure that? And I said, how's that? And he pulled out a bottle out of his gym bag and said, you take the morning drink. You take the morning drink and you'll feel better. And I took that morning drink and I started to feel better. Fast forward, I'm playing in this game. I'm still bombed from the night before, but I'm playing basketball. Guy gets a rebound, throws it out to me. I go for a fast break. I'm looking up and I see three baskets. I'm not sure which one to shoot for. <laughs> and I go up and I miss the basket completely. And my coach yanks me out of the game. Shame. Guilt. Authority, anger, rage, being shown up, all that insecurity started to churn up in my... A couple of weeks later, I'm in a classroom, and a priest, I go to a Jesuit Catholic school, a priest is asking a bunch of questions. And I'm a smart guy, I'm a smart ass, really, and I'm asking, you know, and he throws me out of the classroom. And when I open the door to say, Father, why'd you do that? He comes at me, and I grab this priest, and I knock them out. I didn't go to hell right away. Take it easy. <laughs> I'm telling you these two stories for a reason. And the reason was, it's the first time in my life that this anger and this rage that I had inside of me, which was all internal, became external. It's the first time I displayed something that I didn't even know where it came from. I really earmark it as the time that I became my father at the age of 17 years old. And for the next bunch of years, I either got angry at it or I drank at it. And that's really my story. You know, I'm a double-edged sword guy. One part of me is always blaming everyone for the way I feel, what's going on in my life. I don't have the breaks. I got all the excuses why it's your fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my best friend's fault. It's my girlfriend's fault. It's my ex-wife's fault. It's the boss's fault. It's not having this, not having that. I always have an excuse why I feel the way I feel inside, but then the other side of me is always searching something for out there to fix this thing inside. King alcohol, drugs, cars, money, women, you name it. And I'm all screwed up. And I'm growing up in this neighborhood, and I'm growing up with these guys, and, I'm, and I see that they, they seem to be able to wear life like a loose garment. They're able to move on in their life. They're able to have relationships. And see, what's going on with me is I'm taking that first drink. I have no idea that the first drink is getting me loaded. It takes me years before I come into Alcoholics Anonymous to hear that silly statement, but how true it really is. 
Because I got all the goals, I got all the aspirations, I have all the dreams that you guys got, but I'm taking that first drink. And these guys are moving on, they're getting careers, they're getting women, and they're getting all this stuff. And why can't I do that? My ass is planted in a bar. I can't get out of that bar. I have all those dreams. I want to come to Fort Lauderdale and experience a, a, a thing with Kathy. <laughs> a parking lot with Kathy. <laughs> so I'm about 25 years old, and... I'm an everyday drinker at this point. I won't, I'm not drinking to get hammered every day. I'm just drinking because the alcoholic life seems the normal one. Doesn't everyone drink in the morning? Doesn't every drink, everyone drink at lunch? Doesn't everyone drink before dinner and after dinner? Doesn't everyone go to after-hours bars till 2 o'clock in the morning, 4, 4 o'clock in the morning in New York? I thought that was a normal way of life. But I'm in a bar one day, and I see a girl across the wall, across the room, and, I, and I, this is how I do relationships, ladies. I grab my sister and say, listen, I'll buy you an illegal substance if you introduce me to her. She does, and we're married like seven months later. <laughs> now, I don't care about her. I don't care about me. I don't like her. I don't like me. I'm, I'm, I'm irresponsible. Uh, I can barely hold a job, even if I have a job, but I'm under that delusion. I think that's the biggest thing that we suffer from in here is these delusions in our minds. I think that if I just get this thing set the way it's supposed to look, I'm going to be okay. And I think that if I get married to this woman, that I'll be able to settle down what I don't understand is I have the inability not to take that first drink. I'm powerless over alcohol, and I don't know that at that point in my life. And what happens is I get married to this woman, and four months into the marriage, I walk out of this marriage because drinking's more important than being a married man. And I take off for Boca Raton, Florida. Who knew I'd be back here? <laughs> and, a, and a friend of the family had a, a pretty nice condo on the river, uh, on the ocean, the shame, the guilt, the remorse. I always like to say that somewhere along the lines, God cut my head open and he put a chalkboard in my head. And on that chalkboard was these three emotions of shame, guilt, and remorse. And it seemed like everything that I've accomplished up to the age of 25 created one of those things. The shame of being a failure as a son. The shame of falling out of college. The shame of not being able to hold the job. The shame of walking out of a marriage. The guilt of the things I was doing. By this time, living on the streets and hanging out on the streets, I became a little common criminal. Nothing big time. Just a, just a real pain in the neck to a lot of cops and a pain in the neck to a lot of people. You know? So there was a lot of guilt and remorse associated with that stuff because my parents never sat me down and said, Jim, this is how you break into a car so you could steal it. You know, Jim, this is not how you, you know, steal a rob a house. I mean, they didn't, they didn't, they tried to give me those morals, those values and all that stuff. But here I am in Boca Raton, Florida, looking out a glass window like we are right today at that beach, the bikinis, the boats, the beach. I mean, everything a man seems to, to would want. And I'm getting that knock at the door. The knock of the four horsemen of terror, frustration, bewilderment, despair. Every day's a day when I'm waking up and it's Groundhog Day. Every day's a day when I gotta take that first drink. And I'm like now 25 years old, 27 years old, maybe even a little bit older. And guess what? I'm at this point in my drinking where I don't even need to take that first drink. I just need to crack the seal of a bottle of Johnny Walker Red and I know that that thing is gonna come back very shortly and we call that grandiosity. And when I do take that first drink, that little perfect kid comes out. And all of a sudden, it's everyone's fault for the way I feel deep down inside. And what happens to me is I eventually come back to New Jersey. And again, the shame, the guilt, the remorse of the way I was living, and the people I hurt, and the people I walked out on my life, I couldn't face them. I couldn't face that stuff. You know, I'm a coward. And so I make a decision when I come back to New Jersey is to live on the streets or live wherever I could live. And for the next 18, 19 months of my life, I was homeless on the streets of New Jersey, northern New Jersey. And I would skip into Manhattan once in a while. I'd jump to turnstiles. I'd do that thing. I'd get arrested a couple of times just jumping a turnstile. I'd get tickets. I'd get disorderly person. I'd get all that kind of stuff that's attached to this way of life. And I'm always, you know, stealing, I'm always robbing, I'm always panhandling, I'm always borrowing money, I'm always trying to do something, I'm always trying to escape reality. And I take that first drink on a daily basis. And my life is a total mess. And as my good friend Peter says all the time, one night on the street is one night too many because I lost myself out on the streets. I lost everything that I identified myself with. I lost my emotions. I lost everything. It's just, you know, when I read that for the first time, pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization, man, that just nailed me right between the eyes. 
that's me. That's me. That's what happened to me. And what happened in one day is I walked into a bar. And my intention to go in this bar was to borrow money, steal money, whatever I needed to do that day. And when an old timer walked up to me in the bar, he goes, Hey, Jimmy, they're hiring guys like you at Newark Airport. <laughs> Finally being seen for my potential. <laughs> Newark Airport. Okay, what are we doing? Well, there's an airline called People's Express that are hiring guys like you. Guys like me, all right? So the next day, me and two guys robbed the car, and we went to uh, Newark Airport. <laughs> now, I tell you that for a reason. All three of us are in AA, and all three of us had to make amends to that same guy over stealing his car. <laughs> kind of comical, but, you know, only in AA. But I go out to Newark Airport the next day, and I am dying of this thing called alcoholism, and I don't know it. It's everything out there that's the problem. I don't even know what's going on inside of me. And for years, I couldn't tell you what I really felt. I couldn't even put into words how I was, how sick I was, how physically sick, emotionally sick, spiritually sick. I was just a broken young man at the age of 29 years old. And I walk into Newark Airport. And this airline, People's Express, you know, the job was to take that luggage that's over there and hopefully get it on the plane over there. And I always like to segue here to let you know, if you flew through Newark Airport in the 80s and you still haven't received your luggage... <laughs> We can make amends after this talk, but, uh, <laughs> but but what happened was, you know, I'm waiting to get, uh, I guess it was an interview, and, and, and I sit down in a, in a chair like this, and b big circle of chairs, and, and again, for years, I couldn't tell you how I felt, and it wasn't until I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and eventually opened that book, Alcoholics Anonymous. The book they were writing for all of us 20 years before I was born. Bill puts it perfectly on page 8. His first step experience is probably all our first step experiences. No words could tell the loneliness and despair I felt in a bit of morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I met my match. I've been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. And for a brief moment in that airport, I sat in that chair and I said to myself, maybe drinking's a problem. How delusional. A blind man could see I'm an alcoholic. I couldn't see it. I couldn't see it. But all of a sudden, a complete stranger sat next to me. And after a couple of minutes, he looked at me and said, what's your problem? For whatever reason, I know the reason today, it's called God's grace. I spit up my life story on this gentleman. In about 10 minutes, and he looked at me and said, I have the solution for you. I said, what's that? He goes, where do you live? I said, wherever I could put my head down. Now, this is pre-cell phone, pre-beeper days. He pulled out a piece of paper, and he wrote down a street. He goes, you know where this street is? I said, yeah, that's my old neighborhood. He goes, is it possible for you not to take a drink today and meet me at this address at 7 o'clock tonight? I said, I don't know. I want to drink right now. It's like 10 o'clock in the morning. Try not to drink and be in front of this address. He put a number in front of that street. He said, be in front of that address at 7 o'clock tonight. And all I could say is, but for the grace of God, at 7 o'clock that night, alcohol-free, standing in front of this 153 Linden Avenue, I can remember it to this day, shaken, delusional. Did that really happen today? That's how shot out I was in my mind. Did I really meet someone? Was I even in Newark Airport today? That's how bad I was. But what happened is a 1979 Chevy Impala pulled up. And the stranger was driving that car, and he had a bunch of other strangers in that car. And when they pulled up, they rolled the window down. They said, most spiritual thing we'll ever hear in AA, get in the car. <laughs> and they, and they, they took me probably less than, I don't know, 400 yards, 500 yards around the corner to my grammar school. Where I had all sorts of contempt towards God, towards goodness, towards nuns, priests, you name it. I had contempt. And they walked me into my first meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous. For years, I thought it was bingo. Who knew? It was AA. <laughs> and walking into grace doesn't feel like walking into grace. I felt like I was walking out of chaos. And on March 28, 1987, they walked me into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I've been with you guys ever since. I remember walking down that battleship gray painted staircase. And why I say that is because I think every Catholic school in America is painted battleship gray. I could smell it right now, that paint. It never dries. It just... 
And I remember walking down that hallway, and I looked in that cafeteria, and the first thing that occurred to me is six years old, I mean sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Goals, dreams, aspirations. I sat in that cafeteria. I want to be somebody. Now, I didn't want to be a union worker, and there's nothing wrong with that. I eventually became a union worker. But I wanted to be someone. I wanted to get out of the lash of my father. I wanted to prove myself. But what I didn't understand is I took that first drink. And when I took that first drink, all bets were off. I remember walking down that hallway a little bit further, and I started to smell coffee. And when I say that, I'm being generous when I say coffee. <laughs> you old-timers remember this. Some of you young guys might not have to Google this, but there was a thing called Sanka back in those days. <laughs> Sanka, Sanka was something that the astronauts drank with Tang. I think. It's... For the sake of the story, we'll just say I could smell the coffee as I got closer to the room. But then I met the most important guy we'll ever meet in Alcoholics Anonymous. We call him the greeter. And that gentleman put his hand out, and I grabbed that flimsy reader, and he pulled me into you. And like I said, I've been here with you ever since. And I'll never forget, he gave me something that was probably the most important thing that anyone can give anyone in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. He gave me a piece of dignity that day. Because he didn't judge me. He didn't care that, you know, I was dirty and smelly. He didn't care that every other word was a profanity. You know what he told me? He said, keep coming back, kid. He gave me a piece of dignity back. He told me to sit up front because I'd be able to hear better. He got me a cup of coffee. He started to introduce me to people. And then that complete stranger became my sponsor that night. He walked up to me and said, his name was Richie, yes. He said, Jimmy, I'm your sponsor, and this is your home group. So on day one, I had a sponsor and a home group. I don't know what they are, but I got one. <laughs> but I can remember three days. I could, it was unbelievable, these three days on my first week. So on day one, I got a sponsor. I got a home group. I'm part of something. I have no idea what I'm part of. Back then, the kindness of strangers, 12-step calls were, you know, seemed like every day we went on a 12-step call. That's how the old timers were. They put me up. I like to say a hotel. It was really a motel. But they put me up in a motel. They knew where I had nowhere to go. They did something for me, which you guys, if you lived up north, you know this. Two guys department store. They went to two guys department store and bought me some jeans and some T-shirts and my first pair of Chuck Taylors. Who knew they'd be so fashionable, you know, 38 years, 30, whatever years later. The kindness of strangers. My fellowship. People that care for each other. And that next day, when they picked me up at this motel, I did something that was very unusual for a guy like me. Because, you see, I'm so shut down emotionally. I don't talk about how I feel. I don't show any emotion. I don't even know how to express an emotion other than anger and rage, you know. But what happens is to me, you know, this guy Richie picks me up, and I, and I shared this emotion. Tough guys don't share this kind of emotion. He said, Richie, I'm scared. Why are you scared? I feel like drinking today. I know you do. And what I would witness is what a trusted servant in Alcoholics Anonymous does. He called his wife and said, take me off the calendar today. I'm with a new guy. He took me to three meetings. He fed me three times. I drank 700 cups of coffee that day. <laughs> and I felt like I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I haven't done anything yet, but I just felt that I was a part of something that I, I just felt okay when I was around these guys. Day seven. I met with my new sponsor, my new home group. Still don't know what they are, but I got them. And I'm at a business meeting for this home group. What's a business meeting? <laughs> Richie runs up to me. Got a good idea. I said, what's that? He goes, I want you to take this job. What job? I want you to be the ashtray cleaner. <laughs> ashtray cleaner? What are you, out of your mind? I didn't say that. In my head, I said, what are you, out of your mind? And I had a reason for that. Now, I've put every possible substance in my body, but guess what? I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, so why do I have to clean ashtrays? <laughs> but for the first time in my life, at the age of 29 years old, I was aware of something, that there was a small voice within me, this piece of God that was deep down inside of me. And I listened to that small voice. And that small voice said, just trust him, he's trying to help you. And what I could tell you is from day seven to this moment standing right here, I've been attached or I've been connected or I've been tethered to Alcoholics Anonymous through a commitment. 
whether it's through my home group, whether it's through my district, or through it's been through my area, I've been tied to this thing called service. And it saved my life. It has saved my life, being part of you, to give back, to live in that paradox. In order to keep it, you've got to give it away. And that's how I started off in, in Alcoholics Anonymous my first week. I got back with that wife. Things came back very fast to me. You know, I got back with that wife. We had those two little AA babies who went out 33 and 30. You know, I got a real job. I got a house. I got a car. I started to have money in my pocket. You know, and to the untrained eye, it looks like normal living is a solution to alcoholism. But in five years without a drink, I got a rope. I'm just looking for a bridge to jump off because I'm dying of something I don't understand of. I'm dying of something that we don't we weren't even talking about back then. I'm dying of this thing called untreated alcoholism. You see, I'm physically not drinking. I'm buying the lie that abstinence is a solution to a spiritual problem. But I'm ready to kill myself with somebody. I don't know what to do about this stuff. Ego and pride has now stepped in. You don't go to your sponsor and talk about that stuff. It shows weakness. I'm a tough guy still. I don't talk about weakness. I'm still that guy that has that belly filled with fear. I'm still that guy that has the belly of insecurity. I'm still walking around with secrets. I think I could be a free man. And I'm still walking around with secrets. And I don't even know how to talk about that stuff. So when I come into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and you guys say, Hey, Jim, how you doing? You know, I put the AA game face on. The veins are about to pop. I'm fine. I'm fine. And at five years without a drink, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm in a lot of trouble. Again, a lot of trouble. I'm asked to do a talk on the second step. Now, again, I have no relationship with God. I believe in God, but what does God have to do with this stuff? You know, I could tell some jokes. I could, I read the 12 and 12. I could throw some lines out. So I'm at a podium. I'm, you know, paralyzed by what you people think of me. And so after the meeting, everyone comes up, shakes my hand. I'm six foot four. This guy walks up to me, six foot four, and he looks at me and says, you're screwed in a little bit saltier language. And I want to have a fight with this guy in the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous because I don't know how to face conflict without, or confrontation without, you know, violence. I feel threatened. I don't know what to do. And I'm in my head, and I'm standing, and I'm like, hit the guy, not hit the guy, hit the guy, what do I do? You know, I have no clue. And that's where I am physically separated from alcohol with five years of sobriety, active member of a home group. But I step back in another God moment in my life. I look at this guy, Bill Grace. He's coming in from St. Paul, Minnesota, the same place where my sponsor is today. And I look at him, and I say, you're right. I need help. And I find myself in a railroad room apartment on the Jersey side of the Hudson River overlooking New York. And I'm with this guy in a, this railroad room apartment. If you remember what they were all about, it's like all your families came over and lived in one apartment. So it is like a 100 people in this apartment. And this guy got a Jack Russell. Anyone know what a Jack Russell is? A Jack Russell is a dog that is like a newcomer with 40 cups of coffee in them. This, this dog is running the walls. And I'm like this. I'm getting dizzy watching the dog. But Bill is asking me a few questions. He's giving me that spiritual test, maybe the spiritual test that some of you guys have been given. First question he asked me, how long can you hold your breath? How long can you be in a 12-step program and not work the 12 steps? What does your relationship with God look like? Well, I believe in God, but again, what does God have to do with any of this stuff? What makes you alcoholic? And the best I could stammer out of my mouth in that moment, five years in the rooms of AA, the best I could stammer out is, I drink too much. I had no idea what I was up against. Then he asked me a question that many might not believe, but this is the way it was in my neighborhood back then. He looked at me and said, where's your big book? And I looked at him and I said, what's a big book? Now, I'm sure there was one at a literature table. I'm sure there was one at a lectern. I'm sure it was somewhere. But to be honest with you, we were never encouraged to open up that book. We had speaker meetings. We had discussion meetings. We had 12 and 12 meetings. It wasn't until Joe and Charlie came through the Northeast that people started to get jacked up about the big book. And then he looked at me and he just said, Jimmy, if AA works, why do you have so many problems? Because I'm not working AA. I'm just not drinking. I'm going to meetings, and yes, that's important. Don't let, don't let me downplay that in, in any way. But I'm not recovering from what I'm suffering from. I'm so delusional what I think this is really about, and I'm not asking questions. I'm too afraid to go to my sponsor and talk about what I'm really feeling. So what happens to me is I start to get on the steps with this man. 
He starts to paint a picture for me, a picture that I like to picture, uh, paint for the guys that I sponsor. He says, Jimmy, we really have two goals in Alcoholics Anonymous, two goals that I believe today. The first goal is the obvious one. Don't pick up the first drink. But the second goal is the one we really want to attain, and that's to step into the sunlight of the Spirit, to have a spiritual experience, to have a relationship with God. Because when you step into the sunlight of the Spirit, guess what happens? All those promises that our literature gives us come true. The bondage itself gets removed. You have a relationship with God. There's a sense of freedom. There's an ease and comfort that comes to all of us once we have this experience. But in order to have this experience, in order to step into the sunlight of the Spirit, you need to walk through the darkness of your life. And as I sit in my house, and like he did with me, and he pointed to a door at the end of the hallway, and just like every guy I've ever sponsored, I said, there's the goal. It's to step out there into the sunlight of the Spirit in the Jersey Shore. But if you really want to be free, you need to walk through the hallway of life and need to uncover, discover, and discard the things that are blocking you from God. One of the things I love to read, and I read it every time because it's, to me, it's one of the most powerful pieces of literature that, that, that's written. It's, it comes out of daily reflections. And if you turn to May 1st, it says, it's the side of myself that I refuse to look at that rules me. I must be willing to look at the dark side in order to heal my mind and my heart because that's the road to freedom. I must walk into darkness to find the light and walk into fear to find peace. The way the old time you should put it is like this. Alcoholics Anonymous is like a big bonfire, and a lot of people are walking around the fire, but eventually the fire is going to go out. If you really want to grow, if you really want to change, if you really want to have an experience with God, you've got to walk through that fire and get your ass burnt and feel the uncomfortability of change. And I was willing to walk through the fire on that day because I was sick and tired of being sick and tired of five years without a drink. I want to be better. So I was willing. And what makes us willing? Circumstances make it willing. I was sick and tired of being the man I was in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was sick and tired of not doing anything, just taking up space. So he started to talk to me about Silkworth. He started to talk about that first step. I live right by Silkworth's grave in New Jersey. I can't tell you how many times I passed that cemetery, Glenwood Cemetery in West Long Branch, New Jersey. How many times have I passed that cemetery and I look into that cemetery and what do I see? I see two of you guys, two of you girls. Beach chairs, folding chairs, whatever. And I know what you're doing. You're reading that important, that important chapter. Because it was in that chapter, the doctor's opinion, I started to understand something, what I suffer from. This physical allergy to alcohol, it's starting to make sense. Once I take that first drink, I can't stop. The phenomena called craving takes over. And I can't stop. It makes perfect sense to a guy like me. All I need to do is go through my history. Was I ever able to stop on my own power? Now, the mind will say, or the ego will say, yeah, remember 1978, Jim? You had two beers and went home? Doesn't want to talk about the million other times that I didn't go home. And then we started to talk about that obsession. And most important, we started to talk about this thing that's deep down inside of every one of us, the spiritual malady. Old timers used to say this all the time. Alcoholism is a soul sickness caused by a separation from God and a disconnect from each other. I've had so many walls up in my life that I'm not letting you in. I have so many walls up that I don't want God to be in. I am protecting myself because my ego and my pride doesn't want to let you know who I really am. And I'm suffering in silence in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I see it all the time. But what Bill did with me was he showed me that, you know what, AA is not about getting us to quit drinking. This is quite the opposite. You can't quit. Lack of power is your dilemma. You have no mental defense. So it was so important that he brought me into the chapter of We Agnostics because that was really the wake-up call for a guy like me. I think it's the wake-up call for all of us because I think AA is designed to awake us to the great reality called God and to have an experience. And then I got on my knees with this man, and we took that third step prayer. And I didn't know that prayer, and he did. And up to this point, I've been, I can't tell you how many prayer circles where I've held men's hands or women's hands, or anyone's hands, and I've been okay with that. But for some reason, when I got on my knees in, in this guy's kitchen table and held his hands, and he read, the, he knew the prayer, I had to read it out of the book, something was different about that. Something was different about that. I could feel the spirit of him come into me for some reason. There was a shift. There was something going on inside of me. I couldn't explain it back then. I know it today. It was all God. And when I got off my knees, he said, Jim, next, next, we launch. 
on a course of vigorous action, strenuous, intense action. We've got to get those walls down. I had to do something that I thought was a weakness, but really a strength in disguise. I had to be vulnerable to another man. Tough guys like me are not vulnerable. I'm not letting you know how I feel. But Bill Grace opened me up, and I was able to discuss this with this man everything. And as I started to go through those steps, you know, I had an unbelievable experience in my fifth step. I, other than my two children being born, it was the most powerful, my original fifth step was the most powerful experience I've ever felt in my life. After I was done with this long talk, I knew something that was very clear, that I couldn't go through that doorway into the sunlight of the Spirit with a secret in my back pocket. So I gave him everything. I gave him my life. And what happened is he showed me on page 75, you take the hour, you go home, take the book off the shelf. I didn't do that. I went to a place called Liberty State Park on the Jersey side overlooking Manhattan on the Hudson River. And I walked out on this pier and I sat down on this pier and I read those first five proposals. I thank God for what just went on. Are the stones properly in place? You know all the language that's in that paragraph. And all of a sudden tears started to come down my eyes. And I looked to my right and about a quarter mile to my right was the Statue of Liberty. I looked across the river, and right in front of me was the World Trade Center. I looked to my left, maybe another quarter mile, and there's Ellis Island. Symbols of freedom. And here I sat as a 32-year-old man on this pier. Tears come down my eyes, and for the first time in my life, I felt okay. Okay. And for a guy like me, that emotion was the most powerful emotion I've ever felt in my life. I'm okay. I am okay. And then... I fell for the biggest trap we have in Alcoholics Anonymous. I fell prey to comfortability. All of a sudden, overtime was important. All of a sudden, coaching girls basketball was important. Coaching my son's Little League team. Nothing wrong with that stuff, but it overtook my primary purpose. And what happened to me over the next bunch of years, I wanted to tell you, I had a spiritual experience, but the truth of the matter is, I worked the five, first five steps, did a few amends, and I thought I had a spiritual experience. And I fell prey to the character defects. I fell prey to the delusion that my character defects have value. I think anger works for a guy like me sometimes. I know how to push you away with anger, but I also know how to reel you in with my anger, too, because I'm a manipulator. We all have those traits. So what happened to me was, you know, I just went on with life. Still married, kids are growing, working a job, getting sicker by the second. Couldn't see it. I like to describe it like it's like we live on the ocean. You know, you take the boat out on the ocean, right? You point it east. We went out for the sunset, uh, sunrise this morning. This thing called a cloud got in the way, but it was okay. <laughs> but you look at the horizon. You look at the curvature of the earth. You look at the, you know, the, the, the horizon. You look at the sun. You look, it's the same view every day, every morning. And that's how my sobriety came. And what I couldn't see was... I was drifting from town to town to town because I never looked back. I was off the beam. And at 10 years without a drink, I did something I'm totally ashamed of. But it's been amended. I walked out of my wife again. And I walked into the arms of a woman in AA who understands. And I, and I blew my life up quickly. I blew my life up quickly. I'll never forget to this day when I looked at that eight-year-old and five-year-old. I am the level of selfishness inside of me. I couldn't even look at those kids' eyes when they were saying, where are you going? And I couldn't even walk out. Alcoholism had me in its grips again without a drink in my body. And I walked out of that house never to go back again. Within three years, my anger, my rage had me arrested again. I threatened this woman, restraining orders, the whole nine yards. And at 13 years without a drink, I walked into a bar. I am done. I finally understand what Dr. Bob talks about in his nightmare when he says he was stuck between a rock and a hard place. He uses French sublime, or I can't even say it, rock and a hard place. I didn't want to take that drink, but I needed a drink so bad to kill the pain. Bartender, give me a drink. He puts a drink on the bar. Devil and the angel pop out. I'm staring at the drink. Drink it, don't drink it, drink it, don't drink it. All of a sudden, the hand goes around the glass, pulls it back, and when I look up, it just happens to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous who's a bartender. 
And he said, what are you doing? I said, apparently throwing my life away. And I took my tail, I put it between my legs, and I walked out of that bar so defeated. What do I do now? I can't go back to my sponsor. I can't tell the truth. I am so ashamed. I'm so guilt-ridden. I'm so, all those emotions are just eating my lunch. And two weeks later, I, work in a, I walk into a workshop in New Jersey, a church right down a block from my house. This gentleman right here was given a, a workshop. And it's so amazing how the human ego is sometimes, right? Two weeks earlier, I, I want to kill myself. And then when I hear him speak for the first time, I'm like, this guy's too good to be true. Are you kidding me? You know? <laughs> But the story is, I asked him to be my sponsor, and he was my sponsor for the next 15 or 17 years, or whatever that time frame was. And he took me through the work again, and I started to look at the things I needed to start to look at. You know, how many times have we asked the newcomer, are you willing to go to any length? And their head's like a bobblehead doll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we ever explain that? Do we ever explain what any length looks like? I think we do the same thing in our literature when Bill writes 15, 18, maybe 22 times, we beg of you to lay aside your prejudice, your old ideas towards what? Well, let's start with everything. That's a good place. <laughs> and what happened with Peter is he peeled the onion back on me a little bit deeper. Let's really see how agnostic you really are. Because you see, I'm that guy, you know, here, God, take the drink from him, but I'm going to handle the rest of my life. And I can't understand why my life is so unmanageable not drinking. I can't understand why I'm still having problems not drinking. But I started to see some truth about Jimmy. My life should look a certain way when it comes to relationships. My life should look a certain way when it comes to family. My life should look a certain way when it comes to work or money or even Alcoholics Anonymous. And the minute it doesn't look the way I think life should look, guess what? I'm in conflict. Which creates an attitude, which creates an emotion, which really blocks me off from you. The walls are back up. The wall between me and you is back up. And I can't understand why I feel the way I feel. And what I needed to do was I needed to bring those walls back down again. Because I rebuilt them in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous brick by brick. And I couldn't understand why I was cut off from the sunlight of the spirit and why I was cut off from you. It's because I was acting out on a lot of old behavior again. And so I started to get right with that stuff. And I started to clear my life up. And then I hit a little bit of adversity in 1999. I was in a major accident on the job, and I got retired at the age of 41 years old. I've had over 40 operations since 2001. I like to say, you know, I'm really five foot eight, but after they put all the metal on me, I'm six foot four now. It's a miracle how it happened. <laughs> but life was really tough in those moments. Between going through a divorce, going through that injury, all the surgery I was having, it just seemed like it was relentless of what was going on. But I stayed tethered to Alcoholics Anonymous. I stayed tethered to a sponsor. I stayed tethered to my home group. I did what I was asked. I had a commitment in, in the group. I started to do things. And little by little, I started to get a little bit better physically. Went through the divorce. You know, my wife here, Mary Beth, you know, she's my second wife. My last wife, that's for sure. You know. She was a good friend that, you know, she belonged to the Tower Group in the World Trade Center. And she would, have to, she would be the booker. She would ask us to come over. Can you do a 20-minute you know, pitch, speak a discussion? So we'd take a ride over to New York City through the subway, and we go over to the Tower Group in the World Trade Center. I think it was the seventh floor. Give a little talk, lunch, and then all of a sudden, you know, the meeting became a little cup of coffee, became lunch, and we'll be celebrating 18 years of marriage. November. I hope I got that number right. I pray I got that number right. <laughs> I've said so many different years, I forget. But I'll give you a little story. As I went through the steps, I'm coaching girls basketball. Love girls basketball. I don't know why. Because they paid attention. The boys, they're a pain in the ass. But the girls, they paid attention. I saw this game. It's intense. It's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And God grabs me by the back of the head. He goes, look in the stands. And I look in the stands, and I see... Mary Beth, my wife, sitting with my ex-wife and my mother. Wonder what they're talking about up there. But the truth of the matter is, that's an example of the amends process, of being able to show up for my ex-wife and be a father to those children, and to be able to be comfortable enough to bring my wife around that and that we could all heal as a family. See, this is a family illness. We know that. 
and we were able to heal as a family. And when my daughter got married, we were able to walk her down, me and my ex-wife, walk her down the aisle. It was a moment that just brought tears to my eyes because how much healing took place because of the 12 steps and with God, that anything can happen in here. We all have amends stories like that. I can give you 20 more amends stories of how God just showed up in my life and all of a sudden, you know, things were okay, no matter what was going on. You know, so, but adversity, adversity. We all go through something. I think we have such an unfair advantage in here. You know, where else can I go where I can hear things that everyone is going through? Lately, I've been talking about my mother. I don't know why. Oh, I know why. But it's been really laying on my mind lately about my mother. My mother gave me everything. She took care of me. She bailed me out. I don't want to call her the great enabler, but she was the great enabler. She got me out of every jam possible. She was able to set aside her pain and her anger at her son because she knew someone had to help me. And she always showed up. Now, my dad died when I was 18 months sober. My dad died. I walked into the house. I found my father dead on the floor. What do you do? I'm 18 months sober. Now, I've seen dead people like kind of on the streets, but I never, this was personal. This was my father, the one I just clashed. But when I got sober, there was something shifting in that relationship. He saw that I was hanging out with you guys. He was happy I was hanging out with you guys. He saw a change in me. And 18 months sober, when I found him dead on the floor, I'm programmed at this point. I call my sponsor. What do I do? Well, call 911. Let's pray. So I'm starting to pray over my father. All of a sudden, the first cop shows up. He's taking down the information. He looks at me and goes, I don't see you walking the streets anymore. I said, yeah, I don't do that anymore. He goes, as a matter of fact, I don't even see you drinking in the bars that I go into anymore. I said, yeah, I don't do that. He goes, well, how do you do that? I said, I go to this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. And apparently it's working. I'm not drinking. 18 months sober. He said, that's great. And because I'm programmed, and because I went to so many 12-step calls, I could see the questions coming. And I was able to 12-step that cop over my dead father's father. God will use you without your permission. Two months ago in my own group, and there's some witnesses here with this, I get a tap on the shoulder. And when I turned around, it just happens to be that cop who just celebrated 33 years of sobriety. And again, I, I have nothing to do with that. It's just that God puts us in these positions to help each other. And isn't that what we're really about here? Alcoholics Anonymous? But my mom died last year of COVID. When my mom was 90 years old, the doctors came to us and said, listen, your mom needs a, a, a knee replacement. Knee replacement? She's 90 years old. What are you, out of your mind? <laughs> my mom was like a Jane Fonda freak workout person until like she 86. Like I, at 87, I had to go to an old sports store called Sports Authority and buy five pound and eight pound weights for my mother because the one and threes weren't working anymore. <laughs> like, this is crazy. But she gets a knee replacement. When you're that elderly under anesthesia, it causes dementia. And very quickly, dementia started to eat her, eat her up. I'll never forget, I was sitting up with my wife, Mary Beth. We're sitting at the, uh, our kitchen table, and my mom looks at me, and she goes, I couldn't find you. What? I couldn't find you. What are you talking about? I walked the streets for two years looking for my son, and I couldn't find you. And it was like God just said, just be quiet. Because after a couple of minutes, we just looked at each other, and it was a different conversation. She didn't know who I was. She didn't, you know, when you become the parent of your parent, and I've heard that from a million of you, it's a different story. It's a different story. We had to get her into a assisted living. We put her in assisted living in the last year at the age of 94 years old. She got COVID. Just got my knee replaced for the third time. Doctor calls me, or the or the or the assisted living place calls me. Get here, she's going to die. So I go over to the assisted living, put on the PPE, take the test, good to go. I walk in, hospice nurse squares me. She's not going to be able to hear you, or she, she's not going to be able to see you or speak to you, but she knows who you are. She'll hear you. I'm like, okay. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't see her for uh, probably 60 days because everything was shut down up in, in, in North Jersey. And I walked in, and what I witnessed was a skeleton. 
I couldn't believe that was my mother. I'll never forget sitting down. I said, hi, Mom. And her chest exploded with breath. She knew I was there. And I had that moment. That moment that all you guys talk about. The moment I've heard from a million podiums. The evidence of God. Being able to share that last breath, those last hours of my mother. Out of all the kids in my family, God picked me. How grateful am I for that? My brothers and sisters are all over this country. But I was the one that God picked. The black sheep. <laughs> and I had that moment, and I held her hand. And when I left, it was, God, it's your turn now. And an hour later, she died. I'm so, so grateful to you guys to walk me through that, to be there for someone else, to show me what it means to be of service to others in a way that I'd never been before. What a moment that was. I'll never forget that. And as God takes one life away, God brings another life. Because my daughter came home one day, or came over one day, and said, you, mom, her mother, Mary Beth, her stepmom, I got good news. You're going to be grandparents for the first time. So in about, I think, 45 days, we're going to be grandparents, apparently. (laughs) So we have a little baby girl coming into the family, and uh, we're quite excited by that. Quite excited by that. We won't spoil her, of course, but, you know. (laughs) And just to wrap this up, um, it's really unbelievable over the last 35 plus years where God has taken me without my permission. 2006, we, 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 we wanted to have a home group in my, in my neighborhood, which was really a three legacy group. Steps, service, recovery, you know, unity. We wanted to do all that. We wanted to have a solid group. So we had a meeting at my house. It was like 12 of us. And on the experience of uh, our past or our experience of our membership in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, we, we created this group. And at the end of that meeting, I'll never forget, we went to pray. And we prayed that the first night, 30 people would show up. And that first night, 175 people showed up to the meeting. Now, it's not as big as some of the groups I know down here in Florida, but... Uh, We've been averaging anywhere from 200 to 300 every Sunday night. It's a big book study. After we go through the book, we do the uh, 12 traditions over three weeks, then the book again, and then the concepts of another three weeks. And we were a meeting that became a group, and we said, well, we're going to be a group. We need a GSO. We need a group a general service representative. Jimmy, why don't you be the general service rep? Why don't you be the GSO? Oh, oh, oh. That's how I felt. And I felt like that because I was going over off an old idea. And the old idea was I was about two years sober. There was only two guys in the city that I grew up in that were involved in service that I was aware of. Two of them, they were both cops. Now, you might have to Google this, young people. One guy's name was Jackie Gleason, and his sponsor was named Mickey Rooney. No kidding. <laughs> only in AA. But they were the only two. So I'm 19 years sober. And I reluctantly, okay, I'll do it. Little did I know the path that God was about to put me on. So about two weeks later, or maybe a month later, I remember we went, we have this thing called the Northeast Regional AA Service Assembly, and it was in Hunt Valley, Maryland. And I went down there. Now I'm 19 years sober. I'm a lot better than I was, but there's still a lot of insecurity. I'm stepping into a new, uh, you know, a new minefield here. I have no idea really about service. I'm, you know, group level, I'm great. Coming out of my district, you know, that kind of stuff, I have no idea really. Fearful, insecure, you know, ego a little bit. I'm 19 years sober, you know, I should know better, whatever. But I go to this uh, service assembly, Hunt Valley, Maryland. I meet two guys that are from Jersey that I think are just two old guys, like my age now, but just two old guys that are from the neighborhood. I have no idea what they do in Alcoholics Anonymous. One of them is a past United States trustee at large. The other one's the Northeast Regional Trustee. And they take me under their wing. And they start to explain what this is really about. They start to open the world of Alcoholics Anonymous to me. And I start to go down this inverted triangle. And a, and a gentleman that uh, became my service sponsor is a guy by the name of John Q, who's a past delegate and a past United States trustee at large. 
One day he hands me the service manual, a book that we should all be reading, right? And he says, open up to S20, and I just want you to read this thing. You know, why do we, why do we need a conference? And I'll paraphrase here, you know, why do we need a conference? Not to ensure our sobriety. We're here. I know when people show up at Peter's group, he knows what to do with that newcomer who shows up. I know you ladies know what to do when that young girl shows up at the group. You get her under your, under your wing, and you take her through the steps, you get her involved, and blah, 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 and they have a life. But right now in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, just like in New Jersey, right now, this minute, right now, there's a man that's cracking open a bottle of Jack Daniels, not knowing that there's a room filled of people that could have a solution to his problem. Right now in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, there's a single mom that has three kids that can't wait to crack that bottle of wine open and wash her day away. Right now, those 1,300 miles between this hotel and my front door, in every hospital in between, there's a baby being born destined for alcoholism. So I started to understand that I have a responsibility as an individual member, that I start, to, I start giving this back in a different way. I got to start doing something. So I started to understand what this third legacy of service is all about. And John just asked me to make myself available. So I started to move down this thing. I became a DCM. I became the alternate chair. I became the chairperson. I became the alternate delegate. And I stand here today with five, less than five months to go. I'm the Area 44 Panel 71 uh, delegate to the General Service Conference. Right. And believe me, I'm not telling you that for any reason is this. There's two people in this room right now. Your delegates. Tom and Rita. Area 14, Area 15. And I know there's other people in this room that have been to a general service conference, but the last two years, three of us were there. And it's very important for me to let you know that your two delegates did a hell of a job at that general service conference. <laughs> and whether... Whether you agree with what happened or whether you disagree with what happened is besides the point. They brought your voice to that conference. And Tom was on my committee, an unbelievable asset to me, to help me. I was the chair of that committee. Tom was in my committee, and he helped me greatly because, you know, it's a little fearful when you come up to give a report back on your committee. And Tom was there like, a, like an anchor for me. So I truly appreciate But those guys did a great job for the state of Florida and for your areas. I just want you guys to know that. So we carry the message to the best of our ability, and we do it in a lot of different fashions. We do it through committee work. We do it through literature. We do it in a lot of ways, and I loved it, and I do love it. Because that guy right now, how is he going to find us? That young girl, how is she going to find us? That baby born destined for alcoholism. So what's my responsibility? My responsibility, like everyone's room in this room right now, is to make sure that the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous are always open for that person, just like they were for me on March 28, 1987. You guys gave me a life. You gave me a chance. I love what Dr. Bob talks about when he talks about the four points, why we give this away. Number one, it's a pleasure. How many of us have sat at a kitchen table and looked across that table, and all of a sudden that young girl, that young man, all of a sudden they pick their head up of shame and guilt and remorse, and all of a sudden you see their eyes for the first time. Wow, I didn't know we had blue eyes. And you see them start to get a life. You take them through the 12 steps of recovery, and all of a sudden they get involved in their groups, and all of a sudden they do that. Dr. Bob talks about uh, a sense of duty. I always think of the responsibility play, uh, statement. When anyone anywhere reaches out for help, I want the hand of AA to always be there. For that, I am responsible. Dr. Bob talks about a debt, paying back that debt. Richie Schnoor, that guy that I met, the stranger in the airport, he wasn't even supposed to be working that day. He was helping another AA guy out that day. What's the chances that I would have met the other AA guy? Probably slim to none. That God knew exactly what he was doing on March 28, 1987, by putting Richie on my lap. And then the last thing, you know, the great paradox, the debt we pay. In order to keep it, i got to give it away. So we do our best in carrying this message to in all our affairs, practice these principles. Step 12, the gift, the precious gift. And we get to do that for fun and for free. When I celebrate or when we celebrate in New Jersey, um, there's a 90-day pinning. I know you guys do it different down here in Florida, but we do a 90-day pinning, and then you the celebrants celebrate year by years. 
So when you have 90 days, they had, they used to have a gold triangle with a dot in the middle, a G on one side, and an AA on the other side. And what it used to look like is this. 90 days, you come up to a podium like this, you'd be dressed like this because you always had to get dressed. They were adamant about showing respect for Alcoholics Anonymous at the podium. And I'll never forget when I had 90 days, I'm at the podium, and this guy Richie's next to me. And I could see my parents right in the front row. Now, I couldn't see him because of the smoke, but I knew they were there. I could see the, <laughs> I knew what their kneecaps looked like, and I knew they were like right there. And Richie made me a promise that day. He said, Jimmy, holding that pin like this, see that little insignificant dot? That's you. But I want to make you a promise. If you put one hand in G, God, and you put one hand in AA, you'll never have a hand to pick up a drink. And I'm here to tell you guys tonight, or I'm here to give you guys a promise. If you're new, coming back, struggling, if you could put one hand in God and one hand in Alcoholics Anonymous, and get involved in these three legacies of unity, recovery, and service, I guarantee you, you'll never have a hand to pick up a drink. That's all I got. Thank you so much. Wow, what a meeting that 